Well, the reading today is from John chapter 1, verses 1 to 18. Today we're looking at what I love about Jesus is he is a man, a human being. Uh, Let me read that passage and then we're going to spend a bit of time thinking about it together. In the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were created through him and apart from him not one thing was created that has been created. Life was in him and that life was the light of men. That light shines in the darkness, yet the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man named John who was sent from God. He came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. The true light who gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world and the world was created through him, yet the world did not recognize him. He came to his own and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, he gave them the right to be children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood or of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but of God. The word became flesh and took up residence among us. We observed his glory, the glory as the one and only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified concerning him and exclaimed, This was the one of whom I said, The one coming after me has surpassed me because he existed before me. Indeed, we've all received grace after grace from his fullness. For though the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the one and only Son, the one who is at the Father's side. He has revealed him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, there's a sermon outline there uh, on the screen. Uh, You can send any questions or comments you might have by using the comments box at the bottom of the page. Uh, One of the best radio programs that I know uh, is on ABC Radio, Conversations. Uh, At 11 a.m. each day, day, ABC Radio plays a one-hour interview with a person. Sometimes they're famous, but they're always interesting. The interviewer is usually Richard Feidler. Uh, Through a series of questions, uh, interjections, answers, basically a conversation, hence the title, uh, we gain an insight into this person. At the heart of the insight are this person's experiences, And out of these experiences, the interviewer teases the truths about their life, about how they view life, about how they view the world. Conversations are how we deal with truth in our world at the moment. Uh, By that I mean conversations are personal, relational and experiential. And that's often how we define and convey truth at the moment in this world. Uh, In the past, we might have defined truth by measurement by fact, by expert, by external validation or testing. Uh, Truth now, however, is understood as personal, conveyed personally, inextricably linked to my experience. My experience defines truth. Now, whilst I don't agree with that development in our culture for a number of reasons and the way in which we now deal with truth as a wider culture, I've got to operate in it especially as someone who says they follow Jesus, who has God as their father. I've got to think long and hard about how to talk to other people about Jesus when the world thinks about truth this way. And that's why we're doing this series. As we look at aspects of Jesus, the things we love about him, we're thinking about how to share them in conversations, in a truth is personal kind of climate. And as we do that, God willing, we'll be emboldened by God's work in us to share what we love about Jesus in a culture that loves to hear personal stories. Let me pray and we're going to dive into it. Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you that he lived in this world. Thank you that he is a human being even now. Thank you that he knows everything about what it means to be a human but is unique, significant. Help us to understand this about him to be comforted by this, to love it and to share it. Amen. Well, we've just celebrated Christmas. I'm at point two on the outline. Uh, That time of the year is about so many things to so many different people, isn't it? Uh, You'll see all these definitions. Christmas is. But undeniably at the heart of Christmas is this one truth. It's a celebration of the birth of Jesus. Uh, Remember as we led up to Christmas, we did that series about Christmas basics. And remember how Luke described it as he talked about Mary's experience there with that angel Gabriel. Luke chapter 1 verse 30, then the angel told her, Don't be afraid, Mary, for you found favour with God. 
Now listen, you'll conceive and give birth to a son and you'll name him Jesus. Jesus was born. Jesus was a human being. John, another one of Jesus' biographers, uh, describes it slightly differently. John chapter 1, verse 14. The Word, that's John's term for Jesus at this point, the Word became flesh, took up residence among us. We observed his glory. Have you thought about Christmas in this way? Have you thought about Christmas as the time when we celebrate the fact that Jesus took on flesh? He was born just like you and just like me. That he was a human being who lived here on earth in this dirt. While all the birth narratives describe this truth about Jesus, they're in the biographies of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. Now, Mark starts here a little later in Jesus' life. John has that highly stylized version we just read and we'll come back to that in a moment. Matthew and Luke have very detailed accounts of the events leading up to the birth of Jesus and the events immediately afterwards. They're very clear. Jesus was born of a woman after a nine-month pregnancy. He had flesh. He's just like us. But John goes a little further, doesn't he? Did you pick that up in that verse, John 1 verse 14? Jesus became flesh and took up residence among us. Jesus lived here in this world just like you and just like me. If you scan through the accounts of Jesus' life, those biographies, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, you'll notice a number of things. Luke chapter 2, verse 40, Jesus grew up. He became strong. He developed in wisdom. He had a mind and a body and they grew like any young boy into any young man. Uh, Luke 2, 51 to 52, uh, Jesus had a relationship with his parents. He obeyed them. He grew in wisdom and stature. He developed relationships with people and with God. He was a man who related to real people in real circumstances, in real terms and time. Matthew chapter 4 verse 2, Jesus experienced hunger like any other human being. John chapter 4 verse 6, Jesus had to take a seat because he was worn out from the journey. Jesus got tired. Mark 4 38, Jesus slept just like you and me. He'd fall asleep, sitting in a chair, going to bed at night. John 11, 33 to 35, Jesus is described in a way familiar to any of us who've lost a close friend or a family member. The grief, the anger, the tears, Jesus knows all of those. Uh, In numerous places, John 12, John 13, Matthew 26, Jesus has a soul and it's affected. He experiences emotions deeply, just like you and me. Mark 13, verse 32, Jesus describes the limits of his mind, just like you and me. As a human being, his ability to know certain things is limited, like the end of the world and when it will come. Matthew 13, 53 to 58, Jesus returns to his hometown and those in the hometown recognise him. He is obviously a human being. They know this man. They know his parents. They know his brothers and sisters. They know his trade as a carpenter. Some might still be using the chairs and tables, even the plough that he made. They know he is one of them and that's why they reject him because he's only a human after all. In every way, Jesus took up residence among us. He was a human being just like you, just like me. If we are to celebrate Christmas, we've got to recognise that that truth is at the heart of Christmas. To be blunt, if you remove that, the birth of this boy who grew in to be a man, well, it's not really Christmas, is it? And I love that because it means he's just like me. He experienced everything I experienced, albeit in a different time, different place, different family, different culture, but he's a human being. He stubbed his toe. He went to the toilet. He slept. He ate. He got tired. He rested. He had friends. He went to parties and funerals and weddings. He went to school, he learned a trade, he was a carpenter. His hands had calluses, scars, he would hit his thumb with a hammer. He knew the highs and the lows, the joy, the sorrow, the pain of a broken world and the wonder of a sunrise. It means he left a historical footprint, just like you and just like me. Now even those who debate the claims of Jesus, his claim to be the Son of God, his claim to be God, his claim to die for our sins and forgive us eternally. Even those who debate those claims don't debate his historical significance. Bart Ehrman, who's a New Testament scholar from America, who's one of the leading sceptics about the claims of Jesus, he will always argue vociferously for the fact that Jesus was a real historical human being who left a historical footprint. And none of this stuff is hidden. 
It's not smoke and mirror stuff. God's not uh, undertaking any subterfuge here. Did you notice that in John 1.14? The word became flesh and took up residence among us. We observed his glory. The residence of Jesus was observed. His humanity was attested to by those who saw him, lived with him, watched him, even those who opposed him. Those in his village saw him, attested to him, said, this bloke's one of us. Luke, who wrote one of the biographies, a doctor who knew about investigation and good historical method, he went and interviewed eyewitnesses who'd seen him. There was nothing about Jesus' life that was not observed. And those observations attest not just to the fact that Jesus was like you and me. Did you notice that in John one fourteen, We observed his glory. Now, that's a strange thing to connect to a carpenter from a small Middle Eastern village, isn't it? Glory? Uh, it certainly makes Jesus a little different to you and me. I'm pretty certain, and, and I know I'm being blunt here, I'm pretty certain that no one's going to write our biographies because they observed our glory. The glory is a very simple word. In our minds, when we mention it, we automatically think of gold and thrones and kings and kingdoms and wealth and crowns, and that's connected to it, but they're trappings, aren't they? Put simply, glory means significance. It comes from a Hebrew word that means weighty, heavy. It makes sense, doesn't it? Because the heaviest thing is the most significant thing. We pay attention to the heaviest thing. You're driving from Narrabri to Moree. You don't pay attention to the posty bike, but you certainly pay attention to the B-double, don't you? Because it's the most significant thing on the road. It's the biggest thing. Glory is significance. And the significance of Jesus was observed. It was public. But what was it? What was that significance? Again, it's a matter of debate. It could be. could be his supreme example of what it means to be a human being. After all, there are not many other human beings who are held up in such a way as an exemplar of what it means to be human, of someone who suffered in a, in a unique way, someone who bore suffering in a unique way, someone who treated others in such a different way, someone who knew what it meant to be human in a way that no one else seemed to live. There's no denying that Jesus is significant in this area as an example. Even the Bible in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21 and following describes his significance this way. Being a disciple means that he's significant in this way because you're a wholehearted student follower of Jesus. But I don't think it's limited to that. It's at least that, but it's not just that. I think it's something a little deeper than that. It's hinted in those birth accounts that were given by Matthew and Luke. Luke chapter 1 verse 35, the angel replied to Mary, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the Holy One to be born. Did you get that? Holy One. That's how Jesus is described, even as a fetus, a baby to be, the holy one. It means the unique one. That's what the word holy means, unique. There's there's no one else like him. There's no one else like him. He's like us in every other way, so what makes him unique? Well, that other reading we've looked at this morning, or we've heard anyway from Hebrews chapter 4, tells us. Let me read it to you again. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who's passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to the confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tested in every way as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us at the proper time. Did you hear the statement there about the significance of Jesus? Let let me state it very clearly for you. Jesus is a human being like us in every way except he did not sin. Let me say that again. Jesus is a human being like us in every way except he did not sin. Now, we've been working on a definition or with a definition of sin for the last two years, haven't we? A sin is the attitude and action that says, I am God and God is not. Or if you want to be simpler, sin is I in the middle, just like the word. Every human being has it. Every human being suffers this illness. It's to doubt the goodness of God to do as he says. It's to stand in the presence of God and say, hey, God, I can do a better job than you. It's to want to be God instead of God. We're all like that. It's part of who we are. It puts us at enmity with God. We want his job. 
We want his significance. We want his throne. We want his power. We want to exercise his authority. Puts us under the judgment of God because God says, well, this planet ain't big enough for the two of us, is it? There's one God. So you can have your life without me. But if you have your life without God and you reject the source of life, you only have one other thing, don't you? And that's death. And that's the judgment of God on every human being. Did you notice that? It breaks the planet. Breaks the world, breaks our relationships, breaks us. But there's something significant about Jesus, isn't he? He does not sin. He never shakes his fist at God and says, I can do a better job than you. He's like us in every way, but he never wants to take God's place. He does not sin. And that's observed. We observed his glory, his significance in this way. It's seen when he was tempted by the devil in the wilderness and told the devil to rack off something no other human being has done so consistently. It's observed at his trial when Pilate says, I find no charge that can be laid against this man. It's observed at his death when one of the criminals crucified with him says, I deserve death, but this bloke doesn't deserve death. It's observed after his resurrection when all those who attest to his life attest to this about him. He was without sin. Nothing secret about it. No smoke and mirrors about it. No subterfuge about it. Nothing hazy about it. It's observed as he lived amongst us. Jesus was like us in every way, except he did not sin. Now that is significant, isn't it? Without a doubt. You know that. I know that. But what is the significance of it? Well, it was there again in those verses from Hebrews. Let me read them again. Hebrews 4, 14 through to 16. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who's passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let's hold fast to the confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tested in every way as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us at the proper time. Jesus' unique nature, when he is the same as us, fits him for a very unique job. It was the job described there as high priest. Now, a priest is a really simple job. It's really just to stand between two groups and interact for them, with each other. A priest stands between God and humans and speaks for God to humans and speaks for humans to God. Jesus is uniquely fitted for that job. That's why he's the priest above all priests. He's a high priest. He can do four things that no other human being can do. Firstly, he can represent humans because he is one of them but without sin. He is everything we should have been, everything we could have been, everything we must be but never can be. So he can represent us perfectly. Secondly, because he represents us perfectly, he can mediate for any human being who trusts him. Puts him, that means he can stand between God and humans and speak to God for us because no other human being can stand in the presence of God because no one who sins can stand in the presence of God. That means thirdly, he's our substitute. He's like us but perfect. So not only can he stand for us, Stand before God for us. He can stand before God instead of us. He can stand in for us. He can receive from God what we deserve. More of that in three weeks. And fourthly, it means that he can display God to the world because that's what we were made for. He bears the image of God perfectly, unlike us who bear it brokenly. And so he can display God to the world as God should be known, and more of that next week. That's what I love about Jesus. That's at the heart of what it is to love him. For anyone who knows him well, as a human being, he is exactly like me. He knows me. He knows my life. He knows what it is like to walk in this world with its brokenness and tiredness and hunger and its grief and all the anger that comes with the brokenness in a good way. He's not distant from me. He is me in that he is a human being. And the account of his life just reeks of his humanity in a good way. And that fills me with great delight. This bloke is like me. So don't be shaken. His historical footprint is certain. So don't be moved from knowing him as a human. But let me ask you another question. Do you know him as a human? 
Do you know him as a human? As someone like you? As someone who has lived here? Someone who's not distant? Someone who has lived here? Do you know him in this way? And the other side of that humanity, I love the fact that he's not like me. That he was subjected to all the same tensions and temptations of this broken world, just like me, but never wavered in what it meant to be truly human. He stayed human and understood that God is God and he is perfect. He is not love like me. I love that about him because it shows to me that I can have hope in this world that the gap between me and God the gap that I created by wanting to be God, that gap can be closed by someone like me who can stand in for me, who can speak up for me, who can substitute for me, who can speak to God on my behalf. I love that Jesus is a man because he's the perfect man, perfectly standing in for me before God. That's why he came. That's why in that last verse in that Hebrews reading, I can approach God and more of that next week. So here's my challenge to us this morning. Wouldn't it be wonderful to not only know and love Jesus as a human, but to share him as a human, to share these two parts of his humanity this week? He is just like us. He knows us. He knows everything we experience because he is us. He's a human being, but he's also unique. And it's been observed publicly. He's never sinned. He's everything I should have been but could never be. And so he can actually stand before God for me. That's what I love about Jesus. He's a man, a human. Let me pray. Dear God, thanks for your word. Thank you that we meet Jesus as a human, as a man. Uh, with a physical body who knows everything about what it means to live in this broken world, but to have you as God. Thank you that he is like me, but unlike me. Like me in being human, unlike me in that he is truly human. He's always had you as God. Father, help me to share that this week so that others come to meet Jesus as Jesus, not as some figment of our imagination, some person who exists in a vacuum, but who is like me and not like me. Father, through this we pray that others will come to know you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.